As you said, my name is Justin Maurer. I'm a postdoc here at Rice University in the computer science department. And I'll be discussing one of my projects today, uh, which I've titled Composed Relation-Based Learning, or CORAL for short, and its specific application leveraging structured data or structured information from the biomedical literature to assist with the process of predicting whether or not it's plausible that a drug has a side effect or not. And we care about uh, whether drugs have side effects or not, uh, especially in the post-marketing scenario, because unfortunately, uh, drug side effects are very common. We're a society that uses as a primary therapeutic intervention um, pharmaceuticals. And those pharmaceuticals, their prolific use also pretends, uh, unfortunately, prolific adverse effects. Often these effects aren't found until after a drug is released to market. The way that the FDA currently monitors drugs for safety is to monitor their FDA adverse event reporting system, or FAERS for short, uh, using statistical models. So if there's a statistically significant association between a drug and an undiscovered side effect, they target that for further investigation. What I'd like to do is use the literature, as I said, to inform this process. It's a rich source of potentially causal assertions about drugs and their potential side effects. Unfortunately, it is an informatics problem. Uh, as David talked about briefly in one of his slides yesterday, uh, there's a lot of information, and it's growing very rapidly. This is a graph showing the exponential increase in the number of documents indexed in Medline at each year. And uh, Dr. Swanson, who is a pioneer in this field in the biomedical domain, noted that this only tells part of the story, because the real issue is in the combinatorial explosion of the number of ways in which concepts can relate to one another that these documents talk about. So how do we navigate this informatics problem? By far the most common approach is to use co-occurrence. If two terms co-occur together, you can infer that there's some sort of relationship between them. This can be a direct co-occurrence or it can be an indirect co-occurrence. Uh, unfortunately, though, doing this doesn't uh, use any explicit relational information, even if it occurs in the literature, and as a result can generate many spurious examples uh, or many spurious connections. Uh, so in this uh, example from Swanson's work where he inferred a relationship between fish oil and Raynaud's disease, uh, we might know that they're related through these bridging terms in gray, but we don't know does fish oil actually increase platelet aggregation or decrease it, and how does that impact disease progression? Uh, Rostovsky and others showed that you can use these same sort of paradigms also not just to look for therapeutic relationships, but you can look for adverse uh, side effect relationships as well. So we do have access to those relational assertions due to work at the National Library of Medicine. Uh, they developed a system called SEMREP, which extracts from raw biomedical text simplified versions, simplified views of how concepts relate to one another. They call them uh, predicate triplets. Sometimes they're also referred to as semantic predications. You can see a few examples of those outcomes there in the top pane. Uh, this allows us then to look at archetypal relationships. So if I want to find whether or not a drug is therapeutic for a particular disease, I don't actually necessarily care about how that drug relates in every single way to that disease, but I might care about a subset of that relational information. Uh, again, coming out of work by Rosowski, Friedman, and others, uh, they described what they called discovery patterns, which were patterns of relational assertions between disparately linked concepts which indicate a higher order relationship. In this case, I'm showing a therapeutic relationship or a therapeutic discovery pattern where a drug inhibits some intermediary substance that causes or is known to cause a disease. And so what we really care about then is a subset of the relational information to make an association. Uh, unfortunately, that's still an informatics problem. It's difficult to walk stepwise through that graph computationally. And it's also not clear which discovery patterns should be used for which types of archetypal relationships. It requires our priori knowledge and expert opinion. Uh, our question is, is there a way to uh, learn what useful information might be contained in these discovery patterns for classification, specifically, again, as we're driving towards drug side effect prediction? So the way we get around this is with what's known as a vector symbolic architecture. I won't get into this too deeply. Hopefully the results will encourage you to go look into this actually surprisingly deep uh, area of research from the connectionist cognitive science community. Um, but I'm showing here on the right that the general idea is to generate a vector representation uh, for concepts, especially as they're referred to in SEMREP. So for ibuprofen, we want to encode how it relates to pain. In this case, it inhibits it. We do this for other aspects in the space. Arthritis causes pain. And then at the end of the day, we want to decompose these entangled representations and find out exactly how they might relate. Uh, and in fact, in the algebra of the space, this is exactly what happens um, 
as in this toy example. So to use Roger Schwanefeld's words, uh, this converts that difficult task of exploring all those stepwise connections between concepts to one where we simply compare vector representations. So this forms the core of the choral model. And the last bit there is the learning aspect, which is the machine learning. So this is just an overview to describe what it'll be showing you results for, which is taking the assertions from the SEMREP output that's available in SEMEDDB. You can download this online yourself if you'd like to play with it. Uh, encoding that information in a vector space and composing for drug side effect pairs, drug adverse drug effect pairs of interest. These are from two uh, manually curated reference sets specifically for methodological research and drug safety. They define, based on expert opinion, drugs that are uh, very plausible to have a, a side effect in drugs which they can't find in their expert opinion any reasonable evidence to suggest that they have that side effect or not. So we have positive and we have negative examples. The first one is from uh, Ryan and others. Uh, I'll refer to that as the OMOP reference set. It was developed uh, for the OMOP, uh, Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership Group. The second one is from Coloma and others and is referred to as the EUADR. It was funded by the EU but uh, actually stands for Exploring and Understanding Adverse Drug Reactions, and so that's how I'll refer to that. So we have assertions for both of those. The EUADR covers 10 side effects across a wide range of drugs. The OMOP set covers four very serious side effects, which you'll see uh, momentarily uh, across also a wide range of drugs. And so we can split those into training and validation sets and see how we do. So compared to our previous baselines, I'm showing DBA here, which is a way of applying some discovery patterns that we thought might be indicative of adverse effects uh, and comparing that also to uh, RRI, which stands for Reflective Random Indexing, and that's a co-occurrence-based approach where you infer uh, relationships based on co-occurrence only. You're not taking any relational assertions into account. So what we see is that whether you deploy Quarrel with a support vector machine or logistic regression, um, you get significantly better performance over either of those previous baseline approaches. Uh, random here being this dotted line. Uh, this is on the OMOP reference set here. So how do we compare to perhaps more contemporary approaches that are maybe more sophisticated in their uh, design? Uh, I'm showing one here, which is GEA, which stands for Generalized Enrichment Analysis. It's fundamentally a co-occurrence-based approach, but abstracts the level of the term that you're considering. So instead of maybe considering an ibuprofen, uh, as a specific drug, you would consider all NSAIDs for co-occurrence instead of looking at a specific drug. Uh, the parameters that you end up choosing for this are not clear in, in terms of what uh, abstraction level you should use for what side effect space. So they have widely varying performance across the four side effects that are in OMOP. Those are myocardial infarction, gastrointestinal bleed, liver injury, and kidney injury, all very serious and unfortunate things to have as a side effect. Um, and then we're also comparing to Voss et al. And I think this is a really interesting uh, study because they also use information from SEMEDDB, but they don't use a vector symbolic architecture. And their predictive power using these features is extremely low compared to those same features represented in our paradigm here with vector symbolic architecture. So uh, it's really this rich representation which is driving the performance that you're seeing of this coral model. Uh, so what does that space actually look like? TSNE is often used. It's actually the incorrect uh, method of visualizing this space. If you remember, I, I said I use logistic regression and support vector machines. They're both linear models. So it actually turns out that the most appropriate way to visualize this space is with PCA, a linear reduction technique. In doing so, you can actually see how a single model might be able to accurately delineate multiple side effects across multiple drug classes with just one classifier. So as you move up and to the right in this graph, you're more and more likely to be causative, a, a causative pair. So a drug side effect pair that's true. You have that side effect. And the vice, uh, vice versa is also true. So this is a particularly exciting result, we think. Uh, it shows how the classifier is actually able to perform this function. So how does it do gen generalizing? Outside of these reference sets, is it actually useful? Uh, so I downloaded a list of drugs uh, from an online database called CIDR and trained a model on OMOP and deployed it on these drugs uh, in the context of these side effects. And I looked at the top ranked predictions and I manually went through and saw if there was evidence on the product label to support this assertion. In every single case, except for the two in red, there was evidence on the label. Interestingly enough, isosorbide dinitrate doesn't cause myocardial infarction. It's often used to treat it. But if a patient is exposed chronically to nitrates and abruptly stops taking nitrates, they can have uh, a collapse of their <laughs> arteries and actually have a heart attack. So it seems it's actually a side effect of not taking the drug if you're exposed to it. So we'll call that a false, uh, false positive, but perhaps a plausible one. 
Amlodipine is more interesting, though, because it's not contraindicated for kidney injury at all. It's prescribed to people who may have kidney failure, in fact. But it turns out that if you look at the FDA's adverse event, adverse event reporting system, you'll find that there's a statistically significant association with amlodipine and kidney injury. So both our model, which is based only on the literature, and the FDA's own system is flagging this for further investigation. We actually think this is exactly how we want our system to work, working in concert with the FDA's current system to flag potentially dangerous uh, associations that haven't yet been disclosed on a label. Uh, that's a very small fraction. Oh, and if you're, if you're a little bit worried about this left-hand column, perhaps you should be, at least if you're in a Danish cohort or a UK slash Canadian cohort, because it turns out that we're finding that there's a pretty strong uh, association between COX-2 specific inhibitors and myocardial infarction. And if you're like me, that's what you primarily use to treat your headaches. So some cause for alarm there. These are mostly in very high doses in clinical settings. Uh, so how does it do? beyond just the top 40 examples. So here I'm showing, again, training only on the OMOP and testing on uh, a list of about 1,000 drugs. So we have about 4,000 predictions that we're making here. And I'm looking at the top ranked predictions. And then uh, CIDR provides this nice resource where they've extracted from those product labels for those drugs whether or not a side effect is on the label or not. So if we have a positive association, perhaps it says naproxen causes myocardial infarction, we then automatically uh, pull from CIDR's NLP, whether or not that's actually on the label. And then we look at the percentage of those top predictions that have support. Conversely, we're also looking at the bottom to see if we're missing things. So what we would like to see is exactly what we see, which is the higher prediction strength that we have, the much more likely it is that there's going to be evidence on the label to, su to support that assertion. And we're not missing very many things down at the bottom end of our prediction strength. So this is an exciting uh, view to say that even though we're training on these small manually curated reference sets, we actually have potentially a lot of generalizable power. Uh, and this is just some work which is forthcoming in drug safety where we show that, um, in fact, you can use these alongside the FDA's adverse event reporting system and even pr improves performance uh, even further on these reference sets on the EU ADR and on the OMOP set as well, and so look for that. I think it should be in the next uh, coming weeks that that'll be published. Um, so in conclusion, ideally, coral uh, is not specific to pharmacovigilance, but in this domain, uh, we'd like to decrease the prevalence of adverse events prior to a drug being uh, relabeled or withdrawn from market. And it does have some limitations, certainly the small data sets. We require some manually curated examples in this particular configuration. Um, but ultimately, I think what's important for this group, and I think it's even true for Lucas, is having a rich representation that you can then feed to a downstream learning uh, environment is what's going to drive really rich performance. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close. Uh, and I like to be a little bit generous with my acknowledgments. So uh, there's tons of previous research there on the right and people who've helped me there on the left. And then, of course, the NLM for their uh, funding support. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. And we do have some time for, for one question, I would say. No question. One question, anybody? Okay, so I do have a question for the, for the speaker. So you said in your, in your talk that uh, uh, the drug you found will be mm, uh, said, I mean, the, the FDA would be warned about these, these interactions, and which is the system for the, uh, you know, for warning, so for having your research um, used actually by the, by the FDA? Yeah, so how, how do we get the FDA to actually exactly. use you. this? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so part of that is hopefully publishing in drug safety and having them see the work. Uh, we know that they have interacted with it. Um, ultimately, I think what they would like to see is interpretability. It's very clear when you're looking at the FDA's adverse event reporting system what's being used for, for the warning. There's a statistical association in observed cases in the clinic. Okay. Uh, this literature is maybe a little bit more murky in the sense that this literature-derived model believes that there's a plausible association, but why and in what context and in what way. Do you feel that F the FDA should use your model or that you should run your model and then, or a researcher should run your model and then give you... Uh, I think I think that uh, yeah, <laughs> I think they could be run in concert. Right now, ultimately, a regulator has to go through and, and verify these assertions, 
And so a system like this could assist what the FDA is already doing and saying, okay, we have all of these assertions. Which ones does this literature-based model think we should look at first? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much.